Hey guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the show where we get the folks who are quite literally shifting the way we think about the future. Today, we've got one of them in a lot of ways, Charles Einstein coming to the program. Is it Einstein or Einstein, by the way? Einstein. Eisenstein, Eisenstein. Sorry, I'm, te <laughs> I'm terrible with the names. Well, we've got we've got the one, the only Charles on the program. Charles, thanks for coming. Yeah, uh, my pleasure to be here, Matt. So you've got a really interesting and diverse background, and I want to get into that in a bit. But first, I had to ask you because you had this amazing quote, and it was about miracles. So I'm just going to give you miracles as kind of a guide. What do you think of when you think of miracles? Well, on one level, I think of something that makes me say, "Wow!" Something that that uh, makes it hit home how little I know about the workings of the universe and and how little I know about cause and effect. Um, it's something that humbles me. And on a more intellectual level, I, 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 I maybe even define a miracle as something that is impossible from an existing story of the world, but possible from a new story. So it's an invitation into a larger reality. And that reality can be something like the four minute mile where it's impossible until you overcome that in your head. And that reality can be something very different, which is what you've you've dived into a bit. Can you tell me a yeah. little bit how you got here? Um, as far as miracles go, I, I yeah, um, I think I, I could say that what dislodged me from my birth story and birth religion and birth worldview, the one that the culture inculcates in, in all of us to some extent, was uh, in part, it was events that didn't fit into the mental matrix of the real. Things that happened to me that violated what I thought was possible. And these happened both in, in kind of social relational ways, that that you know it could be like to be seen fully and accepted anyway to be forgiven to receive generosity that didn't fit into my theory of human nature and how human beings work and what they're motivated by so these things uh reprogrammed me a little bit and then also um material level uh miracles that like for example, I was in Taiwan. I mean, a lot of this happened when I was in Taiwan. I was there after college, actually even before I graduated from college, but then after I graduated, I spent nine years in Taiwan and experienced things that my training at Yale University, studying mathematics and philosophy told me were impossible. Well, like what? Well, for example, I um, injured my ankle very badly like this, a severe sprain and 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 it was swollen up like like double its size and red and just i was in agony and so my friend took me to a doctor and the doctor did not inspire confidence in me because it wasn't like some aseptic clinic you know with white and chrome or whatever it was a cement floor only one room so waiting room, treatment room, I mean, all the same room, uh, some people waiting their turn, no privacy, and the doctor is smoking a cigarette. Like this, you know, I am not in Kansas anymore. And then he dug in, when, when it was my turn, he sat me in the chair and he dug in with his thumbs into that swollen ankle and basically tortured me for 10 minutes. And then put this paste on it, wrapped it up and sent me home. And I had been injured in a very similar way running cross country in college. And I knew this is going to take six weeks to heal. I'll probably be on crutches. It was really bad. And then, but the next morning it was better, totally healed. And I'm like, they did not know this at, you know, whatever Yale Medical Center. This is beyond their, their um, understanding of, of medicine. And so the whole story that, that, um, Western medicine is the most advanced in the world. It is part of the pyramid of knowledge that we are building to the sky, uh, that, that the means and methods by which we acquire knowledge and organize knowledge in our society are the best, the pinnacle of human development. Like this entire narrative began to unravel. And with each, each event that I experienced, 
that each 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 event that didn't fit into this reality to to my birth reality was like a tug on the loose threads of this world story. And so after a few things like that happened, encounters with the Qigong master, um, just, I mean, I could go through a lot of different things that happened, but, but I, I, be, I realized that I do not know as much as I thought I knew. And the whole um, prescription for how to gain knowledge and um, how to navigate this, this world and navigate this life, that's suspect now. So I was thrown into a, a place of I don't know, which became the foundation for rethinking everything. How do you do that without going insane? Because one of the problems with N equals one type situations is there will always be statistical anomalies. That's not what I'm saying here. I don't think that is in fact the case. But when you go into something with your eyes too wide open, you oftentimes can f fall for charlatanism. How do, how do we deal with something like that where there's also the, the flip side of, if you look at Eastern medicine and you look at Western medicine, who's producing healthier people? It's relatively straightforward at this point. We could just look at the waistlines. Yeah. Um, so yes. So any, any of these things, so any of these events, like say the, the, the uh, sprained ankle event, I could easily fit that into my old story. I could say, you know, you're in a foreign country. It wasn't as bad as you thought, Charles. Uh, it was going to get better anyway, and you're just giving credit to this doctor who did it. Like I could have done that with with that event. And when when um, you know the taxi driver tells me about the ghost that he saw, the you know, I'm like, yeah, superstitious, uneducated, right? I can. So I, I realized that I could take all of these anomalous events and still fit them into my story. It was, um, it was coincidence. It was um, wishful thinking. It was this, you know, this person is an unreliable observer of phenomena. You know, this person is lying to me, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I was immersed in a culture that to some extent was living in a different reality than my own, a different worldview. So in order to, so basically what I look for when I'm dealing with things like this, when I'm wondering what do I believe, is first I look for coherency. Does this data point fit in with um, a, a whole larger set of data points? And secondly, what is my emotional state? Like what's my state of being when I take on this belief system? So in order to maintain my original belief system, I had to live in a world where, where this culture is backward, where I'm much smarter than most other people and a better observer of reality and less susceptible to delusion. And these people are deluding themselves and imagining things. And even my own experience, I have to discount that. It was this posture of arrogance that I recognized was um, was of the same kind as the um, colonial mindset or the developmentalist mindset, which says we in the West, we know how to live better than you do. Our way is the best way. Become like us. That's called development. Developed means you're like us. Developing means you're not there yet. Undeveloped means that you're not even close. So that same mindset applied to knowledge. We know how to live better than you. We know how to know better than you. And your progress means to become more like us. That mindset, I have, I, I was already disposed to be suspicious of it because I was politically already quite radical at that point. So yeah, um, I mean, it definitely crossed my mind. Like, am I? Am I like all of the explanations? Like, this guy's a charlatan. Um, I was delud delusional, et cetera, et cetera. All of these crossed my mind. And at the same time, um, around that time, I also um, began experimenting with psychedelics. I was just about to ask yeah. that too, as well, because it yeah. seems to be an, it seems to be a gateway for people. Yeah, and that just confirmed to me that that my understanding of reality was rudimentary. 
You would like, I just did a, a podcast episode recently with Don Hoffman, and he essentially thinks we're all living in a a much more complicated world than we're able to perceive, and we create interfaces around everything. So we're experiencing something, nothing like reality, but our brain is translating this reality into something that feels for us more manageable, basically something that we can survive under. And it it kind of jives with what you're saying. I think I'm skeptical of his, his theories, but it's interesting when you look at people that are looking at alternative views of reality through a credible scientific lens. Because a lot of them, a lot of them aren't willing to put theories to the test. But I feel like you're someone who's willing to put things to the test. You know, that, that view that you're talking about is is a pretty standard philosophical view. Um, like Kant was saying stuff like that. You know, like we cannot, we can never know the thing in itself. All we can know is our, our perception of the thing. Um, and there's another level um, of, of a questioning of the possibility of objectivity that says that our perception of the thing is inseparable from the reality, that there is no reality in itself outside of relationship, that existence is relational. And that is, that's one of the um, deep pillars, one of the foundational pillars of, of the worldview I'm, I'm uh, exploring and sharing with the self-sufficient self. But to exist is to relate. And that to the extent that our relationships are cut off, we become smaller. And to the extent that we recover our relationships through intimacy with people and with nature and with all beings, then we become more existing. We become more, um, we become fuller. And that that's, um, I don't know, I, I'm not sure how, like, if we want to get like super philosophical, but to me, the dysfunctions of our civilization come from a story of separation that holds us as separate individuals and holds humanity as separate from nature. From th those basic suppositions, all kinds of dysfunction um, and crisis arise. I want to get into some of those crises in a sec. But first, one thing I've noticed, and one thing I've noticed with your talks as well, you bring up the idea of a story, of a residing or a residual story quite frequently. Can you tell me when that obsession with stories came from and how you see stories playing out in the world around you? Yeah, uh, I'll start with a little caveat, though, that this whole idea that the world is made of story is itself a story. And so there's a little paradox there if you want to use that as a koan. So nonetheless, what I what is clear to me is that whatever material reality is, our social reality, our our collectively constructed reality is woven from stories. The things that seem real to us in our lives, like laws, like corporations, like money, these are nothing but networks of symbol. They're, they're, they are meaningful symbols that are woven together into a story that are embedded in larger and larger and larger stories. So, so if we want to change the world, we have to change the story. I guess that's the long and short of it. And the story you're most focused on or seem to be at least at this point is climate change? Well, no, I wouldn't say I'm most focused on that. Um, I mean, I wrote a book on that pretty recently that uh, basically is inviting us into a, to step into a different story about climate change. That is, I mean, I could go into that if you want. It's um, the story that we hold about climate change is a more of a superficial level of story, you know, compared to the story of separation, the story of self, the story of good versus evil, the story of control. These are the uh, the subtle programs that produce the kinds of human beings that we are familiar with today. And I notice it just like the programming is so pernicious and pervasive. Like I have a five-year-old son and it is hard for me to find movies that that are not about good defeating evil. 
as a solution to the problem. And the problem being caused by an inexplicably evil character. It's hard to find stories that do not program him into thinking that way. And once we look at the world that way, then all of the stuff around immigration, all of the, all of the stuff around terrorism, all of the, the entire prison industrial complex, all of that arises organically as a natural outgrowth of that way of seeing the world. Our system of agriculture even. What's the bad guy? It's the weed, it's the, it's the insect, medicine. What's the bad guy? So this war mentality, this is one of the deep stories that, that and, and people use it to define themselves too, as part of team good, fighting team evil. Everybody thinks that. So yeah, I, mean, I could talk about climate change because that story influences political stories, um, and and things like climate change, scientific theories, and so forth. Does that make sense? It makes sense. But when is something a story, and when is something human or or world nature? So, for instance, with the bad guy, the bad guy is not necessarily a story we tell ourselves. It's a story we see played out day after day. It's a story of, in a lot of senses, humanity and humanity's history. Right. So people are doing. Are you saying it perpetuates the story? So, you, so okay, so suppose, you know, um, somebody uh, commits violence against a woman. Say a man, like, hits a woman, okay? This, that's not a story. That happened. What are, the story part is, why did he do that? We have a story that explains to ourselves why he did that. One story is men are... You've read the book Demonic Males, maybe. Men are just fundamentally brutal um, and, and hate women, and they're governed by testosterone. And therefore, in the story, therefore, progress means in progress might mean men becoming more feminine, um, might mean to, to develop social and legal controls over men, et cetera, et cetera. Like that, that's a whole narrative about the problem and the solution. Another story might be um, that you could hold about that man is he was traumatized uh, when he was a kid. He was um, punished for ever showing anger. So he represses anger until it reaches a boiling point and then he uncontrollably lashes out. Like it could be that he is, he's wounded in some way. The response then might be different. The response might be, mm, what is this wound and how do we heal the wound and how do we meet the, the need that's not being met that is driving his behavior? So that's, and, and this is maybe a bit of a, I've maybe, you know, made a bit of a simplification of what's usually a complex and mixed situation, but that's an example of, the, of how, yeah, that's an example of a story. Have you been to the Louvre? Um, no, I have not. There's it's probably my favorite painting in there. And you're walking through this galley and gallery and you, you look at the painting and you see Goliath. Uh, you see David looking down on Goliath and Goliath is there like the evil bad guy. But then you walk to the other side of the painting and you see the view from Goliath's eyes and you see David with pure evil in his face, slitting Goliath's throat. And it's kind of what you're talking about. It's the Iliad and the Odyssey. It's the concept of seeing both sides of the story that humanity is so bad at. Yes, that's a good example. Uh, and, and you know, there are kind of revisionist takes on the David and Goliath story that say Goliath had this, I can't remember what the name of the condition is when you have a uh, tumor on your hypothalamus or something. He couldn't see very far, essentially. And he was fighting someone who fought from a distance. So it was completely unfair. Right, and he's like really clumsy, you know, he's just like this big overgrown guy, you know, who's, who's awkward and uncoordinated and slow. And then comes David with a sling, which was actually a really advanced weapon. And slingers, I mean, they could hit birds in flight, you know? So they, you know, like you can tell, there's different tellings of that story. And each of those tellings serves um, something else. Like there's a reason why we tell the stories that we do. This comes up in politics too. Like there's one story of America, land of the free, home of the brave, the founding fathers, the explorers, one victory after another, one triumph after another. 
And then there's a story of, of genocide and oppression and colonization and racism and slavery and um, indentured servitude and industrial misery, et cetera, et cetera. Like there's a whole other narrative too. And these are not too intellectually, like these are not just intellectual constructs. They, they have consequences. If you accept one of those stories, then you must also accept that it is our God-given duty to uh, police the world and bring our, our system to others because we're the best. Like, and, and if you're in that other narrative, then what we should do as individuals and a nation is very, very different. So that's why there's such a struggle to control the narrative today, because, because stories give us as individuals identity and purpose. And what, they, they simplify things. It's not just this, it's not only that. It's like most of what we do with our gifts only matters and makes sense if it's coordinated with other people. Unless like, you know, you're a hermit and and I mean some people like it doesn't matter what everybody else does, but if you're building a computer or a house, uh, anything beyond your own two hands, anything that has to have other people coordinated with you, there has to be a story of that thing that coordinates you with the others. And, and tells you, here's why you are doing what you are doing. Here's who you are in relationship to the world. You are a architect, you are a prison guard. You are like, otherwise, why would you be doing this all day? If there weren't a story that told you why and who you are. Well, how do we write better stories? Well, so I think that, uh, not to get too esoteric here, but I think that the stories, um, it's, it's about becoming aware of the next story that wants to be born, um, to, to recognize it, and then to describe it to others and to share it. So it's more that, that we are discovering stories rather than creating stories. And for me, I, I guess I, um, when I see a little piece of the world as it could be, I feel a sense of recognition and homecoming. Like, yeah, this is how it's supposed to be. When I see somebody being really, really generous, and maybe that generosity is resting in a story of, we're all in this together. You are my brother, uh, and there's enough for everybody. Someone's really grounded in that story, then the generosity that they display and the gratitude, it, it's like it evokes a memory in me of the way that things will be someday, a memory of a more beautiful future. And so I recognize the feeling communicated by these little bits and pieces of another story. And then I begin to put them together. Is it possible to this is something that we've discussed a lot with some other past guests as well is just the fact that we're moving towards an inflection point when it comes to humanity's progress and where we're headed the the story so to speak the systems that have gotten us here we're evolving beyond where those make sense we're evolving to the point where we need to be able to move beyond that how do we yeah. do how do we do that in a peaceful way? Is it you have to kill everyone on Earth and restart? Do we have to move to the moon and just have a bunch of in vitro babies born there? Because a lot of what you're talking about is the nature versus nurture debate. So I think that, yeah, we are, um, we are reaching the, the, the end of a story that has carried civilization for thousands of years. And it is, in a way, you could say the story is ripening. It's reached its maximum expression. And as yin gives birth to yang at, a, at its extreme, so also is this story giving birth to its successor. And that birth process is a convergence of crises that are like a birth crisis, pushing us out of the world that we have been in. And even if we try to hold on to it and grasp for uh, you know, make America great again stories or something like that. Still, we are being propelled down the birth canal toward a, a world that is 
qualitatively different than anything we've known. Um, a revolution that is, so, so the previous revolutions, I mean like the agricultural revolution, industrial revolution, information revolution, these were intensifications, landmark intensifications of the story of separation. That, and each one of them took us to a position of greater mastery and dominance over the rest of creation. And now? And now what we are faced with is a different kind of revolution that isn't an intensification. Even though that's trapped in that story, we think maybe that our salvation lies in intensifying where we have already been going. So that if we finally develop nanotechnology and precise genetic engineering, then we can engineer the world and ourselves to finally finally redeem the promise of technology, of a, of a, tech, of a utopia. A finish line. Yeah. And I think that that's kind of a definition of insanity. When what you're doing isn't working, do even more of it. So there are technologies, I call them technologies of reunion, that are built on a different story, that are built on a story of not of domination, but of cooperation and participation. So like you could, like an example would be regenerative agriculture or permaculture that says that if we really take good care of the soil, we'll be better off too. And our, and, and agriculture is about participating in an, in a overall wellness, well-being that includes ourselves, but is not here just to serve ourselves. And the results from this approach to agriculture are in a way miraculous. Like there are people doing this without pesticides, without herbicides, uh, and getting much bigger yields than, than chemical industrial agriculture gets, um, and replenishing the soil and the water table at the same time. Like things that, that an agronomist wouldn't recognize as in the realm of possibility, it's happening right now. That's, and that's the kind of results that we can get from being in a different story. We become miracle workers when we're in a different causality. Um, yeah, so that, that, that's just one example of, of what I'm talking about. Um, and then so the crises, so basically the, it's a birth crisis in that our uh, customary solution sets do not produce any solutions and we are left helpless. And that, and that helplessness and that humility, that's necessary for us to entertain anything new. Just like- I, I think that's the problem though, is it's not that the solution sets we have don't work, it's that they over time become less and less and less effective. So it's almost like the tide going out or your hair growing. You see the changes happening over a longer period of time, but it's not like you cut your hair every day. It's not like you're willing to make that shift immediately because it seems like things are working, even though yeah. two, two months later, you're still 20 pounds heavier. Yeah, it seemed like it was working. The, the technological program of progress through control of everything else, the benefits in the 1950s, 60s, they seemed huge. Everybody was predicting with absolute confidence that we would have cancer licked by 1990 and unlimited free energy by the year 2000 and space colonies and you know a pill that would cure every disease and robot servants and so forth like that was not even controversial that that was the future and that so so like these rapid gains rapid gains in lifespan for example um they as you were saying, they, they began to hit diminishing returns. Only for the poor, it's still happening. There's about a 10 year gap between the top 1% and the bottom 1% or top 10 in the U S. Yeah, but it's still not going up. Like in the first half of the 20th century, I remember I did this research a long time ago, life expectancy went up by 26 years in the first half of the 20th century. And since then it's gone up by like, you know, five years or six years. I feel like you're dealing with something that's stepwise though. I think I'm I'm personally in the in the more abundance mindset when it comes to to life expectancy, at least for people that are able to access better technologies, have better access to food, health care, not not sick care, but health care. Right. And and then focused on focused on 
I think how do you the, the the there's there's a dichotomy I see emerging more and more so where you have people that want to go back to when times were better because they tell themselves the story that oh America was great and people that want to go forward to the future because everything will be perfect and oh it's fine everything will be grand and there's not really people talking about a middle ground that there were advantages and disadvantages to both and that we have to learn from both periods. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yes. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll pick up with the life lifespan thing. I do think that you're right. I think that there are ways to vastly increase the lifespan, but they are technologies of reunion. They are things that are, that are, um, outside the bounds of conventional medicine and that draw from a really different worldview. And, and yeah, there are people hoping that, you know, whatever will have like modified genes that, that prevent your telomeres from degrading or something like that. Like there are, there are people who still uphold the ideal that, that there will be that technological high tech medicine as we know it is going to make a breakthrough and, cure everybody of old age, stem cells, et cetera, et cetera. Um, my, I'm optimistic as well, um, but my hope is in a totally different realm of technology. And- Why not both? Um, because I think that the technologies of, of control bring diminishing marginal returns. More and more and more investment for less and less and less return. And, just seeing like the the trend line, the the I mean, there was once a dream that you would have a pill that would make you happy, that would fix whatever. And so now we have um, antidepressant medications that that, despite all of the hype, uh, rarely even outperform placebo, and mainly and merely keep people functioning in a they like they help keep you functioning in the world as it is, but it's not like anything like the uh, ecstatic, blissful experiences, or even the the deep sense of well being and peace that is available through maybe technologies of meditation, you know, or technologies um, of of marijuana. Of, of some of the plant allies. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but both. Yeah. Like I do think I'm not like saying that we're going to throw away all of what we, all of modern technology. I think that it's really about discovering what is the proper role and function of these things of, of, uh, you know, computers, microchips, um, nanotech, all these kind of things. Like they have their proper domain what's happened is that they have exceeded the bounds of their proper domain, just as, well, I, I mean, I could draw a parallel to the entire money economy too, but it, that doesn't mean that, that these things are wrong or bad. It's just that we are exploring this last phase of humanity of the last few centuries or a few thousand years has been an exploration of certain gifts that we've been given. Uh, gifts of mind and hand, gifts of culture and technology. Gifts, I mean, we have tremendous power to to um, forge the world around us in the image of our of our conception. We can we can build skyscrapers. We can straighten rivers. You know, we can make giant pits in the ground. I mean, we can do we can build airplanes that fly around. We can do almost anything we want. We can fashion matter into whatever we want. And this, you know, I mean, anti-civilization thinkers critique this as a bad thing. I don't think it's a bad thing, but I think that it's a, a gift that if we're not careful to use it properly, it comes along with a curse. And so the question to ask is what is this gift for? What is it for in participation and cooperation and service to all of life and to something bigger than life, to, to maybe you could say the dream of the planet? Like, why are we here? That's the question we have to ask. Not how do we survive? Not um, 
how do we uh, ascend above nature and above biology and above the flesh? Uh, the, the question is, what are we here for? And the same thing on a personal level. The story of separation says you are here to survive and reproduce. You are driven by your genes to maximize reproductive self-interest. And that is just a story that is, if it ever was true, it is not true anymore. Because if you achieve that, if you achieve maximum self-interest, maximum security, maximum power over others, you're not going to be happy unless you are using your gifts in service to something that's beautiful to you. The same thing is true of humanity collectively. If we are not in service to something beautiful to us and meaningful to us, then we will develop a civilizational depression. We will not be happy either. And we'll have all kinds of problems that come because we're not aspiring towards something that we resonate with. We used to have that. We used to aspire toward that technological future of- the Space race yeah. versus the iPhone. Right. And, and right now, it's like, even if you're in, in iPhone world and technology world, like, you know, someday we'll have, you know, video conferencing on demand. Like that was supposed to be like some holy grail five or 10 years ago. Like you could have a video conference from the beach while you're sitting, sipping your mar martini and the waves are on your feet. But part of, I spoke at a tech conference one time and I said this, I'm like, I'm like, guys, wasn't it supposed to be better than that? Like you can work on the beach now. I mean, what what is there as a collective purpose, a collective story that makes you jazzed, that makes you excited in the same way that little boys in the 1950s were excited to be a rocket scientist? Like what turns us on? What's the story that gives life meaning? We don't have one now. And that's why people are so susceptible to fascistic stories, militaristic stories, racist stories, and so on. We don't have a collective story that makes people excited to be alive and want to participate and want to develop and themselves to participate and to sacrifice something in order to be a good servant of something they care about so much. We don't have that. And I think that, sorry, I'm, I'm just like running on and on here, but just to say that one candidate for that story in the short term, at least, is that we all come together for the healing of planet earth. How do we, how do we position that story? Because it really does come down to purpose. And I would agree with you, people are losing their sense of purpose, which is why we do have higher rates of depression than ever. Because as you go up Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I'm firmly of the belief that it's not a triangular hierarchy. It's a, it's more of a diamond. So it, it you have to have a certain amount of material success to be able to think more about yourself personally. But if that leads negative, that can lead you to dragging you down to lesser levels than if you were at that subsistence level, because you have the time, the energy, the effort to focus on something that can come back to, to bite you, so to speak, if you don't have that driving force. Yeah. I just had a, I just had a conversation with uh, someone from one of my own programs, um, Nipun Mehta, uh, who, who uh, founded an organization called Service Space. Um, and we were talking about uh, Maslow's hierarchy. Um, neither of us are are big fans of it. And we, and what Nipun said, it's not actually that because because he was telling stories about people who are in the most destitute of material circumstances, yet who are incredibly generous, who seem to not have that base level of of, of physical security food, shelter, et cetera, fulfilled, yet they are very highly developed in other ways. So Maslow's hierarchy, I think, is kind of questionable. He said it's more like vitamins. You know, we need we need this, we need that, we need self-actualization, et cetera, et cetera. We need all of these different things. But it's not that one necessarily precedes the other. And in a way, to say that one precedes the other, to say that you have to have, you know, your physical needs fully met, um, like us, before you can develop into the finer realms is also saying that we are more developed in the finer realms compared to the peasants in Guatemala or the you know savages in the rainforest like there's there's a little bit um, of a smugness in that's implicit in Maslow's hierarchy that I am a little doubtful of um, but yeah I mean I think and I think 
what I'm hearing from you too is that that you are intuiting that there's more to the story than than is in the basic Maslow's pyramid. By the way, Maslow himself rejected it before he died. Yeah, actually, what what you bring up now is actually very interesting because it is a it is very much a flawed concept. It is very much a flawed construct. I think we see that a lot in, in society. The the blinders that we have. You got to go get go to college. You got to get a job. You got to find a wife. You got to get that nice picket fence, and then of course yeah, you get the better sure. job. That yeah. that is the better story. That is the story, and I think that's the, that's the bullshit story. Someone gives you life advice, and they're not further along in the life that you want to be leading, then you shouldn't listen to that advice. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. We've we've danced around a lot of topics here. So I know I know you are passionate about climate change and about changing that story. You talked a little bit about how we can do that humanity essentially coming together as a team but what uh what are some ways some technologies some trends that have you hopeful so yeah the most hopeful uh the most hopeful trend that actually seems to be gathering momentum is uh agricultural toward uh using agriculture to heal land when you and to, especially to heal soil because when you heal the soil then you heal the water cycle. And when you heal the water cycle, then you heal the, cl heal the climate. In my book, I, I, I argue that the current um, environmental, the environmental movement today is putting way too much emphasis on greenhouse gases and carbon and not enough emphasis on conservation and regeneration of ecosystems. So, and it's not that I'm, I'm not saying that that we shouldn't limit greenhouse gases, but what I'm saying is that when we see Earth as a living being, and when we see the grasslands and the forests and the wetlands and the whales and the the wolves and the all of these beings as organs, like essential organs, vital organs of a living being, then we know that we have to protect those organs. And we have to heal those organs. And that if we do not, if we say, cut down the entire rainforest, destroy the Amazon, as Bolsonaro seems to want to do, if we destroy the Amazon and offset that carbon with carbon sucking machines in every city and offset the temperature rise by spraying sulfur aerosols uh, through the atmosphere to lighten the sky, we're still, the planet will still die a death of a million cuts if we destroy ecosystems everywhere because it is a living being. And so the, the new story that I'm talking about in climate is to stand first in that paradigm. Earth is alive. From that, and then how do we protect the remaining undisturbed ecosystems? And how do we regenerate through regenerative agriculture and reforestation? Um, and other ecological restoration projects, marine preserves, for example. Like, how do we, how do we return to to health? So, yeah, that's 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 one of the threads, at least, of, of the book. But also, how do we get that message across? When you have multiple messages and you have one blowhorn, so to speak, it can it can dilute the message. I think a big part of the problem is you have to be able to hit home on one thing, and believing that people will change the way they the way they are is not helpful it's it's idealistic short of short of putting lsd or psilocybin or something into the water and giving everyone some type of mini psychedelic trip it would be very hard to change people's world view quickly enough are there other ways that we can try to accomplish similar means by telling an different story that more aligns with the existing paradigm. Does no, that make sense? Yeah. Um, environmentalism didn't used to depend on the climate change narrative. When I was a kid, like in the 60s and 70s, it was save the whales, save the whatever spotted owl, um, save the wolf, save the grizzlies. Why? Why? It wasn't because we will go extinct or we'll suffer trillions of dollars of economic losses if we don't save the whales. 
it was because the whales are beautiful. They are precious. They are sacred. We love them. We want to take care of them. So the appeal to love, I don't think that it's you know idealistic to say that we can't to say that to the, that we can reconnect people to their love of life and their desire to serve a living planet. The form that that service takes becomes more available through a living planet view because it says that that if you can just take care of one ecosystem, your own bioregion, your own even piece of land, and restore the soil and the water in that place. Not only are you beautifying and protecting something that you love, but because this is an organ or, or tissue or a cell of Gaia, you are also strengthening the entire planet. <clears throat> and <clears throat> you know you can argue that from a conventional carbon-centric perspective by talking about soil carbon sequestration rates and things like that, but you don't rely on that. So <clears throat> that means you can appeal to people who are say Trump supporters and don't believe in climate change because they don't have to believe in climate change. All they have to believe is that I really love this stream and I want to protect the watershed because I love going fishing here. How do we gamify it? How do we make a larger scale movement? Is there a, is there a system we could set up for instance? I mean, a climate lottery, something people need to do something to get entered into a raffle or every time that every person that starts up yeah. uh, something. How do we make that at a larger scale? Because I want to change the way people think about the world as well. But I also understand some of the inherent problems we have. Facebook, one of the most addictive things out there, it will depress you. But what can we steal from them to make a bigger impact? Yeah. I wish I knew the answer to that. Um, You'd have a lot of money if you did, that's for sure. <laughs> Well, I'm not. I'm not actually. <clears throat> I'm not. I'm not actually too much of a fan of gamification, because gamification basically says that we replace intrinsic rewards with extrinsic rewards. Like you're doing it. Why? Because you get points in a game, or uh, it's the same mentality of monetizing it and giving financial incentives to, to you know, ecological uh, well-being. And there might be a role for that, but what I really want to do is connect people to their intrinsic biophilia, their, their love of life that I believe all people have, or almost all people, and that is suppressed by our current system that holds us so apart from life and makes it seem that our lives are independent of the other beings on earth. To bridge that, that disconnect and get people in touch with their love of life and then say, I trust you to act from that love of earth, from that love of life in the best way that you see and to maybe give you information about that. But if that love of life is not awakened, then no amount of information is going to be enough. And in fact, and that's, and, and I think it's, it's the current climate narrative of we better change or bad things will happen to us. That's only necessary in the absence of real connectedness to love of life. Definitely agreed, but I would say, I think you're wrong on the gamification thing because look at, look at for instance, meditation apps like a calm, a headspace. People start doing it. They do it because I, I wanna try this out. And then the gamification, that's what keeps them there for that small amount of time. And then they get hooked on the actual experience. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think if you had some type of thing where people go outside and walk in a park for 20 minutes or they go to the woods or they plant a garden and they started doing it, I think that's where people get the love. You can't assume or you can't try to get someone to love something that's not tangible for them. But if you force it to be tangible by gamifying it, suddenly it becomes something they can love and the gamification just fades away. That, that yeah. That's kind of my thought. Yeah, you could be right. Yeah, um, it, maybe it is like a, you know, a good, a good uh, uh, entree into it, just like people go to yoga to firm up their butt, you know, and then they discover- or to meet cute or to meet cute girls or something, yeah. right? Right, and then they discover something else deeper there. That yeah, I'm, I'm. I don't think anything's a bad thing. Like gamification. I yeah, I'm, I'm, I guess it has its role. It's just, um, especially if we understand that its real purpose is to reconnect people with with love of life or reconnect people with something. 
Um, but yeah, I, I'm totally open to that. Yeah, it's like kind of like gamifying an anti McDonald's campaign to try to get people mm -hmm. to stop eating unhealthy, etc. You can kind of do it. The question is the centralized versus the decentralized control. Speaking mm -hmm. of, where do you see realistically civilization headed in terms of the story, the structure? Will we have more nations, less nations, decentralized, <laughs> centralized? <sighs> well, there are multiple timelines leading to very different futures. Um, yeah, I think, so the nation state is a story also. You can't see them from, from space. They are systems of agreement and meaning. And I think that they are becoming obsolete. They're already losing a lot of their power that they once had uh, as transnational corporations become more powerful as um, uh, nations lose their ability to make sovereign laws in more and more areas. Uh, and because the kind of us versus them tribalism that developed into the nation state is also becoming obsolete as we recognize that we're all in this together and that the solution of defeating the enemy is no longer a viable solution in many cases. So the nation state, I think is, is going to disappear. Um, it's gonna fade away in some way. And what will replace it? Uh, Bioregionalism maybe? Um, I, don't, I don't know. I don't have you know, a blueprint for uh, a one world government or anything like that. In fact, I, I'm a bit skeptical of, or even hostile to globalization and the centralization of control that is underway today. But I don't necessarily have a, um, you know, I, th I think that, that what we will come to is something that we cannot see from where we are right now. And that we will only discover it through exploring doomed alternatives through their failure, learning what works and doesn't work and coming to something emergent that, that it's not something that we can design from where we are now. It doesn't mean we shouldn't try, but we should hold on to our designs lightly. Do you think that humanity can make those changes by forecasting the future or do you think we have to hit a crisis? Oh, I think that big changes in life, personal and collective, come through crisis and breakdown. I would agree with that. Yeah. Charles, this has, been a, this has been a fun one. I think we've danced around a lot of important topics to get people to think a little bit more outside the box. I got two last questions for you. The first one would be, what technology scares you the most today and why? Hmm. Wow, I can only pick one, huh? I mean, you can pick two or three. <sighs> I guess it would be geoengineering technologies. Um, for, yeah, if I had time to prepare for that question, I could have thought of, I, I mean, stuff. Uh, Geoengineering, let's see. That one's terrifying because anyone can do it. They don't really need agreement. Yeah. Um, I mean, we could all die from, you know, technology developed in the 40s and 50s. You know, we could all die of a thermonuclear accidental war or someone sends a spacecraft up with plutonium on it and it explodes and showers the earth. Um, I guess I don't really spend a lot of time worrying about any of these things. Um, some of the attempts to make like super antibiotics, that, that scares me because the foundation of life is the bacterial world. And if we let loose a truly effective 
broad spectrum of antibiotic into the biosphere, the consequences would, I mean, yeah, but, but the technologies of domination are inherently dangerous when we understand that we're all interconnected. So uh, the neonicotinoid and, and glyphosate uh, herbicides and insecticides, um, the neonicotinoid insecticides, the glyphosate herbicide, um, these are causing these trophic cascades that ripple out into the entire biosphere and come back to affect us in totally unpredictable ways. So we're seeing precipitous drops in insect uh, populations, insect biomass, insect diversity all around the world. Um, Microbiome as well, which we found is very important for everything that you want and care about in your body and health and heart and love. Right. Yeah, so for me, it's not so much like this is this is like the one most dangerous technology. It's more of a mindset underneath the technology that we need to look at. And if we don't look at that, it'll continue to give birth to very dangerous technologies. I think so, and I think we need to always look at that because technology is a double-edged sword. There's always good that comes with the bad. It depends on how you use it and how you think about it. Charles, I wanna I wanna end this on a high note and get a get a takeaway from you. So if you had one thing, a quote, a call to action, something for people to take action on before you tell them a little bit more about you and where to find you, what would you say and why? Okay. I would say that because we are on a living planet, all things are interconnected because all things are interconnected and because even humanity is an organ of this planet. That means that any healing work that you do in any one place is also part of global healing. So you might look at climate change and, and say, well, my work with troubled youth or my work with homeless people or my work with prisoners, what good does that do? What does that matter? But when we understand that the world outside of ourselves is not composed of a bunch of independent separate things, but that all are woven together into a unity, then you understand that whatever your heart calls to you to do, whatever makes you care, whatever brings forth the love within you and applies it to the world, that's what you should be doing. So you don't necessarily need to know how is this gonna scale up or how is this going to reduce greenhouse warming, or any of that. All you have to know is to listen to the organ of the heart that guides you into being into the right service, that incorporates the information that you get through your mind, brings that in, digests that, and then makes you care about something. And if we all follow that, then we will all be coordinated into the right place and deployed in the right way. So. Yeah, I'm not going to say, here's what you should be doing, but but it's more of a meta level thing. Here's what you should be listening to. Here's how you should be thinking about it. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts, both for good and for bad. Now it just depends on the parts we put into it. Charles, this has been this has been a lot of fun. It's interesting. Hopefully it's expanded people's thought horizon a bit. Where's the best place for people to learn more about you? Well, I mean, my website, Charles Eisenstein, I think it's .org now. Uh, oh, no, no, nice. You got the .org. Yeah, it was .net, but that, I don't know. People were telling me that was a bit retro. so A little bit. Speak, yeah. Speaking of, I forgot to ask you, that the house, it looks awesome. Where are you? What, what exactly is going on in the background there? Well, I'm sitting at a friend's house in Asheville, um, and it's like she was like a earth construction teacher, actually. Janelle Kapoor, her name was. So, yeah, she was like teaching people how to build cob and straw bale and... Um, I don't know, rammed earth, et cetera, et cetera. So she plastered her, I don't, I'm not sure exactly how much of the house is like earth construction and how much of is, but yeah, there's a lot of it in this house. I'm excited about the net zero emission stuff that they're working on, especially some of the states that are mandating it going forward for new homes. Mm -hmm. it'll, be, uh, it'll be super helpful. Well, thanks for coming on today, Charles. And thanks for yeah. tuning in, guys. Thanks Hopefully. for your patience with me. Patience is what we're here for. We get the incredibly interesting and smart people focused on a better future and we let them ramble and we always find incredibly spontaneous good stuff.
So thanks. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Cheers. <laughs>